The Karakoram Range is a western stretch of the Himalayas that lines the borders between Pakistan, India, and China. This remote region of the world has been traversed for generations by traders, but hosts a very sparse population, even when compared to the other remote regions of the Himalayas located further to the east. The Karakoram is a region that has been rife with volcanic activity throughout the ages, and is host to several of the highest mountains in the world. The region is also host to some of the most brutal and unrelenting cold weather in the world, and an approximate 30 to 50% of the surfaces within the range are glaciated. The first Western survey of the Karakoram was conducted by a man named Thomas Montgomery in 1850, who identified six of the most prominent peaks from his survey station on Mount Harakma, labeling them K for Karakoram, and a number from 1 to 6. Most notably, the second highest mountain in the world, and the near consensus most difficult 8,000 meter plus peak to summit, K2 still bears this name, as it was devoid of a well-known local name due to its remote location and lack of prominence from the other massive peaks that surround it. The Karakoram Range in the modern times has become a hotspot for mountaineers and trekkers seeking to soak in the remote natural beauty of the region and conquer the unrelentingly challenging mountains within it. However, of the many visitors the region hosts throughout the year, inevitably, some of them find themselves victims of the harsh, unforgiving weather and terrain of the region, and are unable to return home with their lives intact. However, the year 2013 would prove to be an exceptionally deadly year in the history of the Karakoram. First, however, I'm proud to announce the channel's first sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is a free-to-play mobile RPG offering a true console-level gaming experience conveniently on your mobile phone. Explore millions of champion combinations and master countless tactics as you take on raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, and PvP arena matches. With hundreds of artifacts to equip and over 600 champions blessed with unique skills, build your team, develop your champions, and raid your way. I personally really like Koronar, a tank who controls the pace of battles by reducing the enemy's turn meter with his special ability. I also really like Tatura Rhymehide, a supportive champion that decreases the enemy's accuracy with his primary ability, while also buffing my party's defenses with his secondary ability. And this month, Raids just released a giant new feature, Awakening, and a brutal new dungeon, the Iron Twins Fortress. If you're good enough to take down the Iron Twins, you'll see a huge payoff, being able to awaken your champions. Awakening your champions lets you choose a powerful blessing that can transform how they perform in battle. This whole feature has added an entire new level of depth and strategy, and I've been having a ton of fun playing around and testing things out. But wait, here's the big news. Raid has just released a super-powered legendary version of everybody's favorite champion, Death Knight. The whole raid community has been waiting for this for a long time, and Ultimate Death Knight is everything we hope for. He's poised, he's powerful, he's perfect. And the best part is, everyone can get him for free just by logging in. All you have to do is log in and play raid for 7 days between now and October 27th, and you'll add Ultimate Death Knight to your collection. Easy. There's seriously never been a better time to get started, but there's more. You can also use the DK Rises promo code for a bunch of free items to instantly level your new strongest champion all the way to level 50. This promo code is available for both new and existing players. And if you haven't started playing Raid yet, click my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen. You'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free Epic Champion Pay Rail, 200k Silver, 1 Energy Refill, 1 XP Boost, and 1 Ancient Shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. These rewards are only available for the next 30 days, so download Raid Shadow Legends today to avoid missing out on these free bonuses. Click the link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen to get started today. Thanks so much again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. The 2013 summer climbing season in the Karakoram would take its first deadly turn on the evening of June 22nd, when a group of armed militants would storm the base camp at Nanga Parbat, an event I've covered more extensively in another video, which I'll link on the screen. 
This event would ultimately cost 11 people their lives, and the ensuing violence would only further escalate in the following weeks, bringing the final casualty count of the crisis to 14 people. This tragedy at the base camp of Nanga Parbat would mark the first deadly incident of the 2013 summer season, but would only serve as a starting point for a dark and deadly summer in the Karakoram. Gasher Broom 1 is a towering pyramid of ice and stone, located in the Gilgit Balistan region of Pakistan. Standing at 8,080 meters at its peak, it is the 11th highest mountain in the world and one of only 14 8,000 meter peaks on the planet. The Gasher Broom Group is located in a remote region not too far from K2 and Broad Peak and it is this remoteness that has earned it the nickname of Hidden Peak. And naturally, due to its remote location, Gasher Broom is one of the last popular 8,000 meter peaks amongst mountaineers. Gasher Broom 1 was first summited in 1958 by an American team led by a man named Nicholas Clinch. In 1981, a Japanese expedition team would follow the route that Clinch's team took to reach the summit setting fixed ropes along the route as they ascended. After completing the sixth successful summit of the mountain, and due to their fixing of the ropes, this route would from then on become known as the Japanese Kalur, and would become the standard route of ascent for mountaineers simply seeking to reach the summit. In early July of 2013, a duo of highly experienced Polish mountaineers, Artur Heiser, and Marcin Kotzkan set out from the base camp at Gasher Broom 1 for what would prove to be a challenging upcoming climb. The duo intended to follow the Japanese Kalur route to the summit, but after reaching the summit of Gasher Broom 1, instead of retreating back to base camp, they would instead make their way down and across the ridge to the second tallest peak of the Gasher Broom group, the 8,035 meter Gasher Broom 2. After reaching the summit of Gasher Broom 2, the duo then intended to descend down the opposite side of Gasher Broom 2. The pair were highly experienced Himalayan climbers and opted to travel light and complete the climb alpine style, bringing only the necessary supplies for survival on their person in order to cut down on hauling loads of gear expedition style. They would also be attempting the climb without the use of supplemental oxygen which adds significantly to the difficulty of ascension, as at such altitudes, the surrounding air is extremely oxygen deficient when compared to the air at sea level, making even small manual tasks extremely difficult to complete. On the morning of July 7th, the duo left their Camp 3 at 7,150 meters for their summit push and made good progress throughout the day. They managed to reach an altitude of 7,600 meters before they were faced with a difficult decision to make. The weather that day had not started off well, and as the day wore on, the weather had only continued to worsen, as the pair were blasted by the powerful winds. After deliberating on whether to push onwards for the summit, the duo agreed that it would be unwise to continue any further with the worsening weather conditions. Artur and Marcin retreated back to Camp 3, before contacting base camp to inform them that they would descend further to Camp 2 at 6,400 meters. As the men descended, the storm raged on, and as they trudged through the near whiteout conditions, Artur lost sight of Marcin, who was leading the pair. After losing sight of Marcin, Artur began to fear that his partner had taken a misstep and fallen to his death. Artur then attempted to call his wife on his cell phone, but was unable to connect the call as he did not have strong enough service. He then instead opted to send her a text message that stated that Marcin had fallen on the Japanese Kalur. After sending the text message, Artur began to frantically search for his partner, trying to spot where he could have fallen from. However, unbeknownst to Artur, Marcin had not fallen at all, and was simply lower down the face of the mountain and out of sight of Artur. Suddenly, Marcin saw Artur fall past him from above as he plummeted 500 meters down the face of the mountain. When Marcin reached the bottom of the pitch, he located Artur's lifeless body before continuing his descent to Camp 2, alone 
through the intense storm. After base camp had received word that Artur had fallen, a rescue and recovery operation was launched, but the climbers on the rescue team were repelled by the harsh weather, unable to reach any higher up on the mountain than Camp 1. The following day, a group of Russian climbers were able to reach Camp 2, where they found Marcin still alive but badly frostbitten, sheltering in a tent. Marcin was successfully rescued, but unfortunately, Artur Heiser had become the next fatality of the dark summer of 2013. Later that month, a Spanish expedition team were making a push for the summit of Gajerbrum 1. The summit team consisted of four men, Zevi Gomez, Alfredo Garcia, Alvaro Paredes, and Abel Alonso. On the morning of July 22, 2013, the summit team contacted base camp, informing them that they would be attempting to reach the summit that day. The weather that morning was bitterly cold, and high winds battered the climbers as they clamored for the top. As the day continued on, the foul weather began to worsen, and just shy of the summit, one member of the group, Alfredo Garcia, decided to turn back, as he had begun to suffer some severe frostbite and parted ways with Gomez, Paredes, and Alonso as they continued on towards the summit. The trio reached the summit in triumph later that day, but by this time, the weather had worsened to near whiteout conditions as the climbers would struggle to find their way back to Camp 3. After being unable to reach the four men via radio, a rescue team was organized to search for the missing men. However, the poor weather continued to plague the rescuers, who made labored progress up the mountain, as the storm conditions had made an aerial search for the men an impossibility. However, on July 25th, the rescue party reached Camp 3, where they found Alfredo Garcia, badly frostbitten, but still alive, and assisted him in his descent back to base camp. However, they were unable to find any trace of the other three men, and after the weather had cleared enough to dispatch helicopters, they too were unable to find any trace of the missing men. On the evening of July 25th, the Spanish expedition team released a statement confirming that all hope had been lost for the missing men. Quote, In a final attempt to locate our fellow teammates alive, having no contact with them since the morning of July 22nd, and given the existing adverse weather during these days at altitude, we made a reconnaissance flight which confirmed our worst fears. The three above-mentioned companions have died, they said. Zevi Gomez, Abel Alonso, and Alvaro Paredes were now the second, third, and fourth casualties of the 2013 Gasher Room summer climbing season. In early August of 2013, the president of the Czech Mountaineering Federation, a man named Zdenek Harubi, and his climbing partner, a man named Marek Holicek were preparing for their attempt at a new route on the southwestern side of Gasherbrum 1. Their planned route would take them on a line up the broad Kalur, following a rocky spur to the left of the line. The initial leg of the route had been climbed in 2008 by a team of Russians, but instead of following the Russian route the entire way to the top, the Czech climbers would divert from the Russian route at 7,200 meters instead traversing a rocky ridge to the western side of the mountain to follow the 1977 Slovenian route on the west ridge before completing the climb back on the southwest face. Marek and Zdenek had attempted this climb before in 2009, but were forced to call off the climb after Zdenek suffered a gastric rupture at 7,500 meters. The duo would be supported on this climb by an expedition team of Czech climbers that had successfully completed their expedition to reach the summit via the Japanese Kalur route. After the duo departed from base camp, they made good progress throughout the first few days of their climb. However, on the morning of August 9th, Marek radioed the team at base camp to inform them that they had decided to call off the climb once again at an altitude of approximately 7,500 meters. 
The team at base camp were able to spot the duo descending and watch them make their way down the face through binoculars. However, as the pair continued to descend, the observers at base camp's stomachs would collectively drop as they noticed that one of the figures had vanished suddenly. Shortly after witnessing the climber vanish from the face of the mountain, the team at base camp's radios flickered to life. It was Marek Holacek on the other end, confirming their worst fears. He reported that Zdenek Harubi had slipped and fallen down a 1,000 meter face. Later that day, Marek would again radio base camp to confirm that he had reached Zdenek Harubi's lifeless body at the bottom of the vertical face. His death would mark the fifth casualty on Gasherbroom that summer climbing season. Broad Peak is a remote mountain located geographically between K2 and Gasherbroom. Standing at 8,051 meters at its peak, it is the 12th tallest mountain in the entire world. Broad Peak is named as such due to its uniquely long summit ridge, which stretches for one and a half kilometers. Broad Peak was first successfully summited in 1957 by an Austrian team which notably completed the ascent without the use of bottled oxygen, a rarity at the time. In July of 2013, an expedition team of five climbers from Iran were gearing up for an attempt at a new route to the summit on the southwest face of the mountain. The route they would be following was first mapped out in 2009, but the expedition teams that had attempted the climb since it had been first mapped had been plagued by a slew of injuries and other health issues. However, the 2013 expedition team was optimistic about their chances of reaching the summit successfully that season. The group had taken their time to acclimatize properly, and a favorable weather window was opening up for a summit bid, and so the climbers set out for their summit bid the week of July 7th. By July 12th, Three of the five climbers had successfully reached Camp 3 with little issue, and the trio would begin their bid for the summit from Camp 3 the following morning. The three men, Aydin Bazorgi, Puya Kivan, and Mojtaba Jirahi, would face brutally difficult conditions as they made their bid for the summit, and the trio's progress was slow and laborious. By the evening of July 13th, the climbers had reached an altitude of 7,350 meters, and decided to bivouac there for the night. The following day, the three climbers navigated the steep, rocky terrain above where they had bivouacked the previous evening, making extremely slow vertical progress. By the evening of the 14th, the trio had only managed to ascend 100 meters above where they had begun their climb for the day, deciding again to bivouac for the night at an altitude of 7,450 meters. The trio of climbers continued their summit push the following day and made significantly better vertical progression than they had on the 14th, and had reached an altitude of 8,000 meters, just shy of the summit, by nightfall, and decided to bivouac for the night in order to leave ample time to reach the summit and descend in the daylight. In the early morning hours of July 16th, the trio successfully reached the summit and would begin their descent down the standard route to the summit intending to rendezvous with the remaining two members of their team at Camp 3 later that evening, and facing treacherous conditions on their descent via the normal route, the trio decided to instead descend from the route from which they had ascended. Their descent was labored, and the trio was again forced to bivouac for the night on the edge of the death zone at approximately 7,900 meters. Progress the following day was also slow, and by the evening of the 17th, the group had reached an altitude of 7,700 meters, where they would again opt to bivouac for the night. At 7 a.m. on the morning of July 18th, the trio of climbers contacted base camp, informing them that they were in need of food and water, with Aiden Bazorgi stating that the climbers felt, quote, old, crippled, and unable to move. Unfortunately, their two waiting teammates at Camp 3 had also begun to suffer health complications, and one of them had retreated back to Camp 2, while the other was too unwell to go search for them. 
And so, Base Camp arranged for a team of high-altitude porters to ascend to Camp 3 to offer assistance to the trio of stricken climbers. At 8.25pm that evening, Bazorgi would again radio Base Camp, imploring them to send assistance, as he informed them that their tent had been torn from the mountain by the winds, and that one of the climbers was in particularly bad shape. Base Camp asked Bazorgi to share their current GPS coordinates to facilitate the rescue efforts, which he did. The men were located on a difficult to get to section of the face, near a pass. The high altitude porters reached Camp 3 late in the evening of the 18th, but were unable to go any further due to exhaustion and the poor weather. A group of Swiss climbers assisting in the rescue efforts was right behind them as they would reach Camp 2 that evening as well. The following day, the 19th, base camp lost contact with Bazorgi at approximately 10 a.m. as the team of porters searched the area of the pass, with two Sherpas managing to reach a vantage point above the pass, but they were unable to locate or contact the climbers. At 1.30 p.m. that afternoon, Base Camp was again contacted by Bazorgi, who was at this point largely incoherent, and clearly in dire condition. Over the following days, a sizable search and rescue effort was undergone to locate the missing trio, but the climbers were nowhere to be found. The GPS location shared with Base Camp was on a difficult section of the mountain to reach, which made the task of ascending to the climbers' last known location in a timely manner a tremendous toil for the rescue teams. On July 22nd, reports had begun to emerge that all three climbers were presumed dead. But despite this, a team of Iranian climbers continued to diligently search for them, clashing with Pakistani officials in emails about whether to continue the search or give it up. Despite the tensions about the further risk of continuing the search efforts, the search for the missing climbers would continue until the 24th when it was finally called off officially. One of the key figures in the rescue operation, a man named Thomas Lamy, would matter-of-factly describe the reality of the search effort on the mountain. Quote, I strongly believe, as a mountaineer, these three climbers wouldn't want to risk someone's life to get their dead bodies down. They love the mountains. Why are we not leaving them at this place which they liked so much? Two porters found the Iranian flag on top of the main summit. Therefore, the Iranian route on BP was successfully completed by the three climbers. It seems they took the wrong ridge down the rocky summit, he said. K2 is perhaps the most foreboding and difficult of the 8,000 meter peaks to successfully summit, and summiting this demanding mountain is considered to be one of the highest badges of honor in mountaineering to successfully accomplish. And K2 draws in some of the most dedicated climbers in the world every year, seeking to brave its treacherous slopes and reach its summit. In 2013, a father and son duo hailing from New Zealand would make a bid for the summit of K2 seeking to become the first father and son to do so. The father, a 53-year-old man named Marty Schmidt, was an extremely experienced mountaineer, as he had worked as a guide on several of the Himalayan 8,000-meter peaks since 1975. His son, 25-year-old Denali Schmidt, was also an experienced climber, as he had completed several climbs in Alaska with his father previously along with a successful summit of Broad Peak in June of 2013. The father and son had also assisted in the rescue efforts to locate the missing trio of climbers from Iran a week after summiting Broad Peak, and by late July, they were gearing up for their ascent of K2, a mountain whose summit had eluded Marty throughout his career climbing in the Himalayas up to this point. Marty and Denali were joined on this climb by another man named Chris Warner. However, as they climbed, the weather continued to worsen, and fearing the risk of an avalanche on the mountain, the other six teams that were also on the mountain pushing for the summit decided to retreat down from Camp 3. However, despite the foul weather and avalanche risk, uncharacteristically for a man who had made a career out of Himalayan climbing, Marty was insistent that the weather would soon clear and they would be able to make a summit bid. 
Warner was not convinced and decided to retreat down the mountainside, while Denali opted to remain with his father at Camp 3. Unfortunately, this would prove to be a fatal lapse of judgment, as on the 27th of July, a massive avalanche tore through Camp 3, sweeping away both Denali and Marty as well. Search efforts to locate the missing duo proved to be largely ineffective, and the search party was ultimately unsuccessful at locating their bodies, a fact which tormented Denali's mother and Marty's wife, Joe, immensely, as she described feeling, quote, I felt as if my skin had been ripped off at the thought of being unable to properly bury their bodies. Joe's account of what had befallen her family is a stark contrast to many of the other statements from the families that have lost loved ones in many of the mountaineering stories I've covered on the channel before. In an article written in the New Zealand Women's Weekly detailing the disaster from her perspective is a fascinating and heartbreaking insight into a mother and wife who suddenly had her world turned upside down and the ensuing pain and grief she suffered because of it. However, as much of her account is speculative, I'll not cover it here, but I will leave a link to the article in the description if you'd like to take a look at it for yourself. In 2015, two years after they had been swept away by the avalanche, a gnarly video began to surface online, which frankly is too gruesome to show you on YouTube. In a video I wish I had never seen, as it showcased what appeared to be the dismembered body parts of Marty and Denali including a disembodied head in the snow at the foot of the mountain. I will not be linking that video in the description, and I would also recommend that you not seek it out. At the end of the 2013 summer climbing season in the Karakoram, 24 people had lost their lives in the mountains and in the ensuing violence in the aftermath of the Nanga Parbat attacks, which would mark one of the deadliest climbing seasons in the region's history. I hope you all enjoyed this video, and as always, thanks for watching.